Hello and welcome to the Meta Symposium on Strain here at the SCMR. We have three exciting presentations for you, starting with Dr. Khan Hor from Nationwide Children's Hospital, Columbus, Ohio, who will speak on myocardial strain in RV, followed by Dr. Afshin Fazane Far, Duke University School of Medicine, Durham, North Carolina, with LV feature tracking in cardiomyopathies, and then Professor Andreas Schuster from Göttingen University, Germany with a talk on cardiac MR atrial strain. For more information on the latest MEDIS developments in MEDISuite MR, please visit medisimaging.com. Enjoy! The first presentation is by Dr. Khan Hoor from Nationwide Children's Hospital, Columbus, Ohio, with myocardial strain in RV. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this session. I have no conflict of interest, but we'll focus on RV strain and we'll include some images from QStrain software that my group currently uses. Here are the objective of my discussion. Advancements in medical care and therapeutic techniques has increased life expectancy substantially. As such, cardiovascular imaging has evolved from non-invasive invasive to non-invasive and from qualitative to quantitative assessment. Unfortunately, despite numerous investigation, the idea index of contractility still eludes us today. Prior to echocardiogram and cardiac MRI, assessment of contractility was by indirect methods such as systolic time interval or invasively by maximal elastins, which were impractical for routine clinical use. The lack of an ideal index of contractility resulted in the use of ejection fraction as a gold standard for quantifying ventricular function, disease prognosis, and determination of therapeutic efficacy. As shown on this table, being easy to use, EF does not fit the ideal index of contractility. Five ventricular EF have been used as a gold standard for assessing ventricular function and outcomes. However, the cutting in EF is typically a late finding. Myocardial strain may allow earlier disease detection and have been shown to be more sensitive than EF at detecting occult disease. The assessment of myocardial strain using existing CIN images have become more popular as it allows retrospective analysis without the need for additional sequences. The use of left ventricular CIN images for myocardial strain assessment has become commonplace with mounting evidence of improving outcomes prediction in various disease, as nicely presented by Dr. Fazen Afar. Analysis of CINE images allow assessment of occult RV dysfunction previously challenging for other techniques to the location of RV and its thin wall. RV strain assessment using various feature tracking based software, including QStrain, overcome some of these limitations, have been the subject of intense interest in recent years. Morphologically, ultrastructurally, and biochemically, the RV differs dramatically from LV. The normal RV wall seldom exceeds 2 to 3 millimeter and compared to the LV of 8 to 11 millimeter. Compared with the LV, the RV demonstrates a heightened sensitivity to absolute load change. The RV consists of superficial oblique fibers in continuity with the LV fibers, but the predominant mass of the deep RV muscle fiber is composed of longitudinally arranged fibers. Hence, RV myocardial strain is best performed in the longitudinal direction. Assessment of right ventricular dysfunction by myocardial strain may provide early recognition. The use of RV global longitudinal strain is currently recommended for the assessment of RV function in disease that can affect the right ventricle. Well, there are many diseases that can affect RV. I'm going to focus on three congenital disease, including repair tetralogy flow, detransposition of great artery status post atrial switch operation, and single systemic right ventricle. There are a few primary RV disease, so I will focus on arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy and end with primary pulmonary arterial hypertension. RV strain using various software have been the subject of intense interest in recent years. <clears throat> Here's an example of a normal volunteer showing good tracking and normal RV GLS magnitude of greater than 20. New et al. reported on RVGLS reference range in 100 healthy adult subjects demonstrate relative stability through the ages with no difference between male and female. There is paucity of data in pediatrics, but thought to be in the same range. Kepney et al. in 28 patients with repaired tetralogy flow reported RVGLS is lower compared to control. They show decreased biventricular strain correlation 
and conclude the presence of interventricular interaction between the right and the left ventricle. In the same paper, the authors reported RV uh, function parameters, including RV GLS, correlated with exercise capacity, including peak power achieved. In contrast, there was no association between RVEF with any exercise parameter. To the right, it's in the images of a repaired tetralogy for a patient with low RV GLS compared to the normal subject. Balasubaranian showing 36 repair TR patient improved LV circumventional strain, but not RV global longitudinal strain or synchrony parameters six months post surgical pulmonary valve replacement. Haride et al. from the same group in 31 patients, of which 13 were primary pulmonary regurgitation and 18 were primary pulmonary patients. The group reported improvement in LV strain parameters in all groups except the patient with primary pulmonary stenosis post transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. In contrast, only RV GCS was improved in patients with primary stenosis post transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. They also report improvement in LV synchrony index only in the pulmonary regurgitation group. The authors concluded that these findings suggest a potential long term benefit, beneficial impact of transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. These two studies, however, show the challenges of assessing complex congenital disease with mixed results. And given the small number of the study, it is hard to make a definitive conclusion and likely will need further studies. Patients with this pulse atrial switch procedure have a systemic right ventricle with a high incidence of artery failure. This is a 35-year-old patient with a dilated hypertrophy and dysfunctional RV. The RVF is 40%. And the RVGLS is about 10. Salmon et al. reported in 27 patients status post atrial switch operation that there's lower RVGCS and RVGLS than the control population. And this top table here. Interestingly, only RVGCS correlated with RV ejection fraction, whereas RVGLS was not able to differentiate between those with normal and abnormal RVEF. Patients with single ventricle hearts, and in particular those with hypoplastic left heart syndromes, have a systemic RV exposed to systemic pressure, resulting in risk of RV failure. This is a patient with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, status post of Fontan, palliation, with an RVF of 38% and RVGLS magnitude about 11. May et al. reported lower myocardial strain in a small number of single ventricle patients, including six single right ventricular patients with lower combined ventricular GLS compared to control. The author also showed for patients with serial study, the combined ventricular GLS magnitude declined from 17.3 to 15.9 over the two year period, indicating progression of disease. ARVC involves predominantly the right ventricle with progressive loss of myocyte and fatty replacement, leading to RV, thinning of the RV wall, aneurysm, and result in global and regional RV dysfunction. And this right panel here is a patient with ARVC with a dilated and hypertrophy right ventricle with an RVF of 35%, lower RVG, LS, and significant dyssynchrony between the free wall and the green and the septum compared to the control. Pretty et al. in 32 patients with ARVC reported lower RVG, LS compared to control and RVOTA. Similar to our patient, they reported significant dyssynchrony between the RV free wall and the septum. To date, there is no link between myocardial strain and CV outcomes in ARVC, though the use of myocardial strain is relatively new compared to traditional RV parameters. Talala report 38 patients with primary pulmonary arterial hypertension that RVGLS correlated with RVF mean pulmonary arterial pressure, and pulmonary vascular resistance. In looking at strain and outcomes, Buse et al. reported in 210 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy over a 5.3-year period and demonstrated add va added value of LV strain parameters to detect cardiovascular events. As for the RV, et al. reported in 372 patients with repair tetralogy flow follow over a median of 7.4 years that there's an association of LV strain parameters and RV GLS with cardiovascular event, including death. They noted a combined LV GCS magnitude of less than 20 
and the ROV GLS less than 12 with predictive negative outcomes. Currently, there are no studies showing RV GLS as an independent predictor of mortality. At this time, it may be too early to tell, and refinements and standardization across vendors needed, including reliable segmental analysis. If those refinements can be achieved, cog deformation, including imaging using various techniques, including Q strain, may become fully established in routine clinical practice and may provide insight to outcomes. In the meantime, RV GLS is recommended in clinical scenarios which can impact the right ventricle. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoare. The next presentation is Dr. Afshin Fazane Farr from Duke University School of Medicine, Durham, North Carolina, with LV feature tracking in cardiomyopathies. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you today about clinical applications of CMR feature tracking left ventricular strain. Uh, in this talk, I'll briefly outline some basic principles of myocardial deformation and strain, and then go on to touch on some potential applications of feature tracking CMR, particularly in heart failure, post heart transplant, ischemia, and in patients with myocarditis. The image on the left uh, shows an isolated cardiomyocyte uh, contracting. Um, this is the basis of the cardiac uh, cycle, the systole and diastole that we see so clearly on some of our imaging modalities like the CMR shown on the right. Ideally, when we look at a patient, we'd like to know what is the status of this cardiomyocyte? Is it uh, contracting, functioning normally or abnormally? And if it's abnormal, how abnormal is it? Unfortunately, the uh, the way in which this contraction at the cellular level is, it comes together to create the image on the right is not fully understood and appears to be much more complicated than we initially thought. One of the first clues to this was these uh, superb dissections performed by the Scottish anatomist James Bell Pettigrew in 1856. What he did was meticulously dissect the heart from the outside going inwards. And if you look here in the top left corner, you can see that he was, when he was looking at the epicardium, he could see that the, my, the left ventricular myocardial fibers were orientated relatively longitudinally in a left-handed helical sort of pattern. And millimeter by millimeter, he dissected down until he got to the mid myocardial layers where he saw that the myocardial fibers were now transverse in orientation. And as he dissected further down to the level of the subendocardium, he showed that the LV fibers were again more longitudinally aligned, this time in a more of a right-handed helical pattern. So this gave hints that the uh, the myocardial contraction is quite complicated uh, and is not as simple as it might first appear. Um, so cardiac motion is, we're learning more and more, is a highly complex 3D action and uh, newer CMR techniques, including diffusion tensor imaging, have confirmed uh, what uh, Pettigrew saw and also have added to our understanding of the complexity of how contraction works. However, in day-to-day -day clinical practice, we use ejection fraction. Uh, but ejection fraction is a very crude assessment of all the complexity that is going on, all the complexity which I touched on on this slide and the one before. So other methods have been developed to try and uh, get to the issue of myocardial contractility. Uh, one way of doing this is to examine myocardial deformation, um, which can be used to express contractility. So th the figure on the left here shows a cube which deforms from the solid lines to the dotted lines. This is one movement, if you like, but it can be broken down into deformation in different axes, the X, Y, and the Z axis. Similarly, with myocardial contraction uh, from systole to diastole, the movement can be broken down into three spatial coordinates. 
these coordinates don't necessarily imply alignment with any fibers or any particular uh, functional unit. Uh, they're purely anatomical descriptions. And they can be divided up into long, in the longitudinal plane, in the radial uh, coordinate plane, or circumferential. The one that we're most interested in and which has the most data is uh, deformation in the longitudinal direction shown here by EL. This has the most data and seems to have the most clinical applications at the present time. Strain at its simplest uh, form is just the change in length divided by the original length. Uh, and it can be measured in a variety of ways from complex to more simple. Uh, global longitudinal strain is the form which is typically measured by uh, cardiac imaging, by echocardiography and uh, CMR now. And it measures this, this strain along, typically along the endocardial border and it summates it uh, over the whole left ventricle. Uh, this requires proprietary software such as Medicis Q strain. Um, there are other techniques, more simplified versions of assessing longitudinal strain, uh, which don't require proprietary software, but are much more um, basic in what they're measuring, uh, including mitral annular plane systolic excursion. Just to touch on again, this longitudinal deformation, it's been known since the days of Leonardo da Vinci that this is a fundamental movement of the heart. And we've known, we've known for a long time that the heart, the external surface of the heart changes little in size or volume during the cardiac cycle. Uh, however, the longitudinal contraction of the heart within this fixed volume results in much of the function that we see. So the mitral annular plane moves, as you can see, up and down throughout the cardiac cycle. And what this does is it allows filling and emptying of the, of the atrium and the ventricles. Also, it's important to realize that this movement in the longitudinal direction, because of conservation of mass of the left ventricle also is a primary driver of wall thickening in systole. Feature tracking strain is, has been developed over the last few years as a method to allow a measurement of strain using standard CMR CINE images, uh, as shown here using Medis's Q-strain package. Uh, the importance of this technique is that we can use standard CINE images and don't need to uh, use special um, uh, pulses, pulse sequences to derive the sequence. This also allows us to go back and look at images which were acquired in the past. A few years ago, we decided to look, uh, our group decided to look at the uh, prognostic value of feature tracking strain measured using uh, this technique. And we um, recruited over a thousand patients in four geographically distinct uh, US medical centers with, in, uh, of patients with cardiomyopathy, both ischemic and dilated cardiomyopathy. We measured uh, strain using a Medicis Q strain uh, in all these patients. And what we found was that global longitudinal strain measured using this feature tracking technique is an independent and powerful predictor of adverse, uh, of cardiac, uh, of death. Uh, and this was even when you take into account standard predictors such as ejection fraction and uh, late gadolinium enhancement scar. So the measurement of GLS by this technique allowed better prognostication of patients with heart failure. We subsequently showed similar results in patients with uh, preserved ejection fraction and others have shown a similar relationship in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction also. Uh, more recently, we looked at the value of global longitudinal strain feature tracking in patients after heart transplantation. And in this series of over 150 transplant patients, we again found that 
this longitudinal assessment with feature tracking GLS was an independent predictor of adverse cardiovascular events in this group of patients, allowing better prognostication of these individuals. Uh, interestingly, we also found that if you look at patients undergoing uh, stress perfusion imaging with CMR for ischemia assessment, that the change in um, the improvement in GLS that you get uh, with a peak stress is also an independent predictor of events. Uh, and this is even the case when patients have normal uh, ischemia, have no ischemia and no late gadolinium enhancement. So it can allow uh, a more nuanced prognostication of patients with ischemia also. Uh, recently, Raymond Kwong and his colleagues at the Brigham looked at feature tracking myocardial strain uh, to see if it improves prognostication in myocarditis patients beyond traditional CMR imaging, which is the standard way of imaging patients with myocarditis. And in this series of just under 500 patients, they again showed that feature tracking GLS measured by uh, CMR is an independent and powerful predictor of adverse future outcomes, uh, such that if a patient with myocarditis had preserved a global longitudinal strain with feature tracking and a normal ejection fraction, then their outcomes were extremely good, allowing a, a, a titration of uh, how intensely these patients are monitored, for example. So in summary, uh, feature tracking GLS has been shown to improve prognostication in a range of cardiovascular diseases, including heart failure, post-heart transplant, patients undergoing ischemia assessment, and with myocarditis. Uh, further work, however, is required to show how this better ability to prognosticate uh, will translate into uh, patient uh, management. Uh, and uh, you know, feature tracking CMR measurements uh, have been uh, FDA 510K approved now for certain vendors. So this is an exciting area to uh, ex explore in the going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Farzaneer Farr. The last presentation is by Professor Andreas Schuster from Göttingen University, Göttingen, Germany, on cardiac MR atrial strain. Dear Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity um, to speak today about CMR LA strain. I've got nothing to disclose and uh, I would like to start with an outline. So um, the talk will cover basic principles of atrial strain, explain what atrial strain is, it will uh, talk a little bit about um, how atrial strain is quantified, about the applications, and also about the implications. Where does it clinically make a difference? So what is atrial strain and how is it quantified? The underlying technology is um, tissue tracking or feature tracking, where you follow the tissue boundaries of the atrium and um, the myocardial um, blood, where you then can assess a deformation over the cardiac cycle from phase to phase, where you um, come up by looking at 48 um, control points at a global deformation of the atrium, which allows you to calculate a global strain curve. You're not doing that only in one view, but in two views, in the four chamber and the two chamber view, and then you calculate a global strain curve and also if you look at the time derivative of strain, a strain rate curve. And by doing that, you can assess the three basic functions of atrial physiology. So what do you do with your tracking algorithm? You start at the moment in time where the atrium is at its smallest size, which occurs at um, the end of a ventricular diastole where the atrium is completely sucked out. And then you start your tracking. And what you can see in the global curve here on the bottom left is um, that the atrium fills up. And this is the so-called reservoir phase 
And um, that means the capacity of the atrium to fill up with blood to take the pulmonary venous return. What happens next is that the mitral valve opens and you've got a passive ejection at early ventricular diastole. And this is called the conduit phase, a passive ejection of blood out of the left atrium. This is followed by the active component, the booster pump strain or um, the active atrial strain, where you get augmentation of ventricular filling by an active contraction at late ventricular diastole. So how is this useful? How can it be applied to patients? And um, this is one of the early studies from um, Johannes Kowalik. It's a validation study from 2014, um, where he looked at atrial strain of uh, patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and control subjects. And what he found was that um, the reservoir and the conduit function, they were in comparison to healthy controls impaired in HCM patients and FPEF patients. What he furthermore um, described was that the active atrial strain was impaired in the HFPEF patients by was relatively increased in HCM patients as compared to the control subject, subjects, which suggests a compensatory mechanism of that active atrial function in HCM patients. It's only an example, it's very few patients, but it's only an example how much information you can get out of um, this assessment of the three phases of atrial physiology. So we took that further and applied um, this uh, principle to patients with HFPEF in a prospective study where we looked at 22 patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, which we studied invasively with uh, conductance catheters to assess the relaxation and the stiffness constant of the ventricles. And what we found was that um, the conduit strain, so the passive uh, ejection of uh, blood out of the um, left atrium was the best predictor of exercise intolerance as expressed by VO2 max in that collective. And it was independent of the invasively assessed um, stiffness and relaxation constant, which is still considered the gold standard. So we have an information here which exceeds um, this, um, this invasive assessment in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. What are the implications of um, this information um, you can derive? And this is um, also from 2014, the same year as the Kovalik study, a sub-study from Jao Lima and this group in the MESA cohort. And what they've done is they come up with um, modeling of heart failure um, occurrence in the future. And um, they developed uh, four basic models. In the base model, which you can see on top, um, they included um, risk factors such as hypertension and came up with an AUC of 0.71 for the prediction of um, new onset heart failure in the future. If you add imaging markers such as um, LV mass, you're increasing your AUC to 0.76, which is statistically better than the latter. And if you, um, on top of that, include um, a laboratory testing, so um, a biomarker brain arteriotic peptide, then you're further increasing your AUC. You're getting more accurate to predict heart failure, which again was statistically significantly better. And um, I think the major point here in this paper is if you then on top of that at the atrial strain on that uh, clinical information, which is already quite solid, then you are further increasing your area under the curve to 0.86. And again, this is statistically better than um, just the free uh, models um, for um, themselves. And this, this shows you that there's very strong implications. So very, very uh, solid information in that atrial strain assessment. This is also true in Takotsubos. Um, this is a multi-center study in 152 Takotsubo patients, which were studied three days after their emergency admission. And they were followed up for 3.4 years in terms of um, cardiovascular outcome. And what we saw was that the um, initially impaired um, strain in the, in the atria recovered over time. And um, if you then look at parameters that are predictive of outcome, we were able to identify uh, 
the total left atrial strain as a factor which is related to outcome in Takotsubo patients. And looking at the um, at the kaplan meyer plots here, you can see the, um, the total strain. We are able to identify patients at relatively high risk for events by an impaired um, left atrial total strain as compared to a relatively low risk group um, where the strain is preserved. And this also holds true in the subgroup of patients with a reduced ejection fraction. So if your ejection fraction is reduced, this is generally bad in Takotsubos, but if your um, total strain is preserved, then this sorts of even, evens out and um, the uh, prognosis is not that bad after all. But if uh, your ejection fraction and your total strain is impaired, then we're seeing many more events in Takotsubo patients. There's another paper in myocardial um, infarction patients, and this is a prospective study, a sub-study of the AIDA STEMI and the TAR.N STEMI studies, which included um, both those um, uh, phenotypes of myocardial infarction and after exclusion of um, uh, patients that have contraindications to MRI and exclusion of um, incomplete protocols or poor image quality data sets, we ended up with 1,044 patients, 790 STEMI patients and 325 end STEMI patients with 73 major adverse cardiac events, which um, comprised of a combination of um, death, reinfarction, and um, readmission for heart failure. And um, looking at um, the three phases of atrial strain, so the total strain, the passive strain, the active strain, in the overall collective, in the STEMI uh, subgroup and the end STEMI subgroup, all of those parameters were able to risk stratify and divide the groups into patients with events and patients with um, a very low risk for events. And um, Looking at the, um, at the study group in terms of other uh, parameters, uh, risk factors and so forth um, for events in the future, then we identified um, a lot of factors that were associated with outcome, but only age, um, global longitudinal ventricular strain and KILIP class were independently associated with outcome. And on top of that, um, the left atrial reservoir or total strain was independently associated with outcome in STEMI patients. And to further underpin that or underscore it, um, looking at patients with an impaired ejection fraction below 35% and preserved, relatively preserved ejection fraction above 35%, then applying the total strain, you can still divide um, those two groups into patients at very high risk and at lower risk. And importantly, this is possible in patients with an ejection fraction above 35%, where we usually, usually are not that aggressive with heart failure medication or device therapy. Um, looking at atrial strain, we can identify in this large cohort of patients, because this is the majority of STEMI patients or, or NSTEMI patients, we are able to identify a high-risk group in this, um, well, if, if, if you like to call it that way, relatively uh, low-risk group. So um, looking at other information, which are or which were repeatedly shown to be much stronger than ejection fraction. So infarct size, uh, microvascular obstruction, and global longitudinal LV strain. Um, looking at the total left atrial strain in a high-risk group where the um, infarct size is high, microvascular obstruction is large, and global longitudinal strain is impaired. In all those groups, looking at the left atrial total strain, we were able to identify patients at higher risks, and this is statistically significant in lock rank uh, testing. Furthermore, in the little damage or impairment group, so when the infarct size is small, still by looking at the left atrial strain, you can identify patients at higher risk. The same is true in relatively uh, little microvascular obstruction, and the same is true in preserved global longitudinal ventricular strain. So the left atrium adds something on top in risk stratification after acute MI. <clears throat> 
So I would like to conclude that um, it allows us the CMR uh, feature or tissue tracking to assess strain very accurately in all cardiac chambers, including the left atrium. And by doing so, we can um, derive detailed information about atrial physiology, which, um, which comprises reservoir, conduit and booster pump function. So a detailed look at the pathophysiology. And this information, if we assess it, um, has very strong prognostic implications. And um, these implications or, the, or this information exceeds the value of the classical uh, clinical or imaging risk stratification um, we are mostly doing in clinical routine at the moment. So um, it has an additional value and therefore where we can, we should assess it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Schuster. And thank you to all the speakers here for their great presentations in the Medi Symposium on Strain here at SCMR. For more information on the latest Medis developments in Medisuite MR, please visit medisimaging.com. <laughs>